grab that. Good. Perfect. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Oh, come on. I'm first. I'm not even last. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Patrick Ward. Uh, I work for Microsoft Ireland. Quick show of hands. How many of you were here last year? Not too many, actually. Okay. Well, if you had been here last year, you'd know that I was the guy who came on stage after the guy who pulled down the network. So the guy before me was from Nokia, and he gave away a gift at the end, or he gave away a prize at the end of his talk. He said, the first person to tweet the right answer will get a Nokia Lumia uh, courier to them by the end of the week. A thousand mobile phones are pulled out, the network goes down. Q Patrick Ward from Microsoft to demonstrate how the new Windows 8 tablets integrate beautifully through the cloud with the Windows phone. It turns out that you need a network to access that cloud. It's one of the lessons I learned last year. The other lesson I learned was never arrive at a demo-only presentation without some backup slides or, or whatever it is. I don't just mean the 3G network was down. Absolutely everything was out, uh, just gave up. I think the, uh, I think the uh, network router had some sort of a coronary. It had no idea what it was anymore. Anyway, I'm going to talk to you over the next 40 minutes uh, on the topic of Microsoft as a challenger uh, in mobile. Um, and I'll, I'll define mobility uh, a little later on, but I'm, I'm not just talking about mobile phones here, but I'm talking about tablets uh, as well. Um, and frankly, we are, in, we are a challenger brand. Microsoft is very much of a, a challenger brand. I'll talk through uh, some of our thinking uh, as, we, as we go through that. We're a challenger on tablets. We're a challenger on, on phone. And as Theo uh, referred to earlier on, uh, we're making some good progress uh, on both. Now, before we get started, uh, I want to tell you a, a story which I think reflects quite well on the Windows business right now. This is a story that predates uh, Windows 8. It predates the PC. In fact, we're going back now to 1860 uh, in, into uh, into the States. Uh, the modern kind of United States, I guess, evolved or, or, or came about uh, after the session of, of Mexican land on the left-hand side of the graph there, of, of the map there. And that left Americans with a, with a big challenge. That was in 1848. And at that same time, uh, in California, gold was discovered. And so there was a big migration west uh, of business people, of prospectors, and so forth, the gold rush, as people moved into California. By 1860... The population of California was 380,000 people. That's about the population of Fingal right now, which is where we're sitting. Um, these days, the population in California is 38 million. But this was about the tyranny of distance. The question was, how do we, in the United States, move information from where most of the population live, which is the eastern seaboard, over to the western side of the country now that there's a significant population living there. We're talking about 2,500 miles here, and this is pre-telegraph. Uh, so how, do we, how are we going to uh, get information across? Well, three gentlemen, um, Russell, Majors, and Waddell, set up, a, uh, set up a network effectively. They recruited 200 men and they bought 400 horses, and they set up a network across the United States. They worked out that the average horse can run between 10 and 15 miles, and so they had a station every 10 to 15 miles that the horses would run to. And typically, a man would ride about 75 miles before he'd hand over to the next, uh, to the next rider. What strikes me about this ad is I qualify on not a single criterion on that ad. So this is the Pony Express. The Pony Express opened on the 4th of April in 1860. It had 184 stations, and as I say, on average, it had 10 to 15 miles between each station, covering a distance of 2,500 miles. 
And the idea was the guy had a, had a leather pouch. He'd bring a bunch of letters. He'd go to the station and so on. He also carried two shotguns and a rifle because this was the United States after all. The first day they did it on the 3rd of April 1860, it took uh, 10 days to get from the east to the west. 10 days. And that was considered unbelievable at the time in terms of transformation of uh, tra uh, the, the uh, transport of information across the country. Abraham Lincoln was, uh, was uh, elected uh, in the elections of 1861. And before those elections, they decided, we really need to speed this network up because whoever is elected in that, in that election, we need to get word across to the newspapers of the West Coast as soon as humanly possible. So they teed it all up, they got the horses all ready, they got the right guys in place, and they made it across in seven days and 17 hours. And that, was, uh, that was historic at the time, that was, that was a record. Seven days and 17 hours. This is a photo from later in 1861. And this is one of those young, wiry fellows that were advertised uh, for earlier on, uh, riding his horse and looking slightly bemused at this bu other bunch of gentlemen who were sticking uh, tree trunks into the ground and putting some sort of rope or wire from one tree trunk to the next. He doesn't know, quite know what's going on. This, of course, is the direction of the uh, transcontinental telegraph. The transcontinental telegraph uh, opened on the 21st of October, 1861. The Pony Express shut down three days later, on the 24th of October, 1861. I think it's a great example of uh, disruptive technology, but I also think it reflects where we are as a Windows business uh, right now. Our job in Windows is to deliver the mail and deliver a telegraph service. Because the reality is that businesses, students, consumers, all need to write documents. They need to work on complex spreadsheets. They need to create beautiful presentations. I'm not sure why I pointed over there, but they need to create beautiful presentations. They need to get work done. They need to run a line of business applications, some of which are quite complex. But there's no question about it that there is also a desire for very mobile, light, touch-enabled, app-centric, cloud-connected devices that are thin and light and give an eight-hour battery uh, or more in one charge. And so that's, that's, the, uh, that's the conundrum that we faced as we went to redesign the Windows platform, started about five years ago. Now, when we talk about mobility, I said I'd come back to this, and here's the definition that I put it. As you can see, it's quite a scientific definition. Access to my stuff. The ability to access my stuff from anywhere, on any device, at any time. Favorites on, on my browser, documents, photographs, music, video, all my data, all my settings. That's how I define mobility. That's how mobility is defined uh, in my business. Now, mobility is really important uh, as a trend. This is the 2013 uh, top concerns of, of global CIOs. Mobility is number two. I think what's interesting in this is mobility was number 12 three years ago out of a list of 15. And four years ago, mobility didn't even figure in the CIO's agenda. It didn't make the top 15. Mobility is also important to consumers. Anyone know what this photograph is? Or where it was taken? The Pope. This is the election of Pope Benedict uh, in 2005. This is a picture at the announcement of who has been elected. Here's the photograph of the election of Pope Francis. Now, I'm sure all the people in 2005, or the vast majority of, of them, had a mobile device in their pocket. But it probably wasn't a smartphone, it was probably a feature phone. In fact, an awful lot of them probably had a PDA as well. Do you remember them? A personal digital assistant. I remember we'd go into the pub, you know, people go into the pub like they do these days, and they put the mobile phone on the table, everyone whips out their mobile phone, everyone compares mobile phones, and we all have mobile phone conversations. 
In 2005, we were whipping out two devices. I had my PDA to, uh, to do all my kind of apps and processing and web access and all the rest of it, and I had my phone for, for SMS and, and calls. And what happened there was convergence. The two became one, and it was, became known as the smartphone. And we're seeing convergence as a major trend now in mobile computing devices as well. The idea that I can get my work done and have mobility all in the one device, and I'll touch on that uh, a little later on. Now, I'm going to show you some data, and actually, you've seen uh, some of it already from Theo. I'm going to show you some Irish data uh, from IDC in terms of what's happening with the PC and what's happening with the tablet. I always think this is interesting because in my world, the PC and the tablet are actually becoming one, and so there often isn't a distinction. I'm running this from my uh, Surface Pro. That's a tablet. It's also a PC. Anyone deploying that into their network is just deploying another PC but what it allows me to do is be very mobile, access apps and all the rest of it. But IDC continue to define between, or distinguish between tablets and PCs, and that's fine, so I just want to be clear on what the definition of a tablet is before we have a look at the data. So it's greater than, equal to or greater than seven inch color screen, and can operate with no keyboard attached. So the litmus test here is, if you pull the keyboard and the screen apart from each other, if it still works, it was a tablet, if it no longer works, it was a PC. This is what the device market is doing in Ireland, according to, uh, to IDC. So remember, this is PCs and tablets. This is not mobile phones. And what you're seeing here is actually, despite a lot of the talk about post-PC era and all the rest of it, PCs are broadly uh, holding steady in commercial. These, this is commercial units now, bought through commercial channel, B2B. Actually, we're seeing a slight uplift uh, in PCs this year that's probably uh, partly to do with economic recovery and partly to do with uh, XP and the life and the final refresh cycles that we're seeing there. But what's interesting is the emergence of tablets, and that tre trend continues. PCs hold steady for a while, and then towards 2017, IDC are forecasting a dip. But tablets clearly continuing in, a, in an upward uh, trajectory. That's commercial devices. Have a look at consumer devices, and you see a, a much more emphasized explosion in terms of tablets. I should say as well, by the way, the figures to date are, are what we call FY figures. They're financial year figures. So Microsoft's financial year starts on the 1st of July. The figures looking ahead are calendar years. So I've had to merge the two of those. I'm sure the statisticians in the audience are turning in their seats right now, but I've got two, two slightly different sources of IDC data, so I've had to merge the two of them together. It's also worth noting the consumer devices graph is twice as high, twice as tall as the, as the commercial devices. So if I flatten that, you really get a sense of what's happening relative to the commercial space, what's happening in the, uh, in the consumer space in terms of the explosion of tablets. Again, I go back to the point that I no longer make the distinction of a tablet and a PC. As far as I'm concerned, all of that blue tablets graph is opportunity for Microsoft. And that has been the case since, since Windows 8. We're just pointing out the, the relative scale of those two graphs. In terms of tablets, we're now specifically looking at tablets, 471,000 tablets in the Irish market this year. For every one that's sold in the commercial channel, eight are sold in retail. Of course, the reality is that a huge number of those sold in the consumer channel move into the commercial domain through bring your own device and the consumerization of IT. I often refer to a conversation I had with a CIO in Northern Ireland probably six months ago now, and he said the days of making end user computing choices in an organization without consulting the end users are truly over. There was a time when we'd have the shiny devices in our workplace and we'd have the older technology at home. That is now completely uh, turned on its head. We have the modern touchscreen light tablets and PCs and gaming machines at home and we know the utility of those devices and we want to bring them into work. We're asking our bosses to give us access to that data through these fantastic devices. And that's the consumerization of IT, which we could, do, we could spend an entire other 40 minutes on. 
But the interesting thing is, if we add those two graphs that I showed you together, this year, tablets and PCs will, the graph will cross. I'm hoping the uh, slide cooperates here, okay. This is the year, and again, if this is financial year 14, so it's the year starting 1st of July and then going around through to the end of June next year. This is the year that the same number of tablets will be sold in the Irish market in total, consumer and commercial, as, as the number of PCs that will be sold. I think that's an interesting, uh, an interesting uh, point. Now, just to outline where we're coming from when we talk about tablets as Microsoft, we basically have three configurations of a Windows tablet, and we position them totally differently. The first is a Windows, uh, let me just back up there, the first is a Windows 8 Pro device. This is a laptop replacement. Whenever I'm having a conversation with someone, I'll always say, this is a laptop that's poured into, that's packed into a tablet form factor. And Surface Pro 2 is one of those, and there's a broad range of them from all the different OEMs, Dell, Samsung, Lenovo, and so on. It is a tablet, but it's a laptop packed into a tablet. It's fully domain connected. It typically runs a, a Core i5 uh, processor or above. The Surface Pro 2 comes with eight uh, gigs of RAM, half a terabyte of disk space if you want it. Really powerful machines packed into a tablet. Compare that to an iPad, and it's gonna feel quite heavy. A comparison with an iPad with one of these is just not a fair comparison. This needs to be compared with the likes of uh, MacBook, MacBook Pro, MacBook Air, uh, devices like that, and also uh, with, uh, with Ultrabook type devices. Windows RT is our version of Windows that runs on an ARM-based chipset. And so we've had, until this time last year, the whole history of the PC has been defined as a Wintel device, right? Windows running on an Intel chipset, Wintel. And then along came an alternative called the ARM-based chipset. It used less power, it was less powerful, but it did the fundamentals perfectly well. iPad, Android tablets, pretty much every smartphone all run on an ARM-based chipset. And so you had, the, you had the choice until last year, do I go for the kind of workhorse PC on which I can get work done, or do I go for the really light, mobile, touch-centric, app-centric, you know, app cloud-connected uh, tablet? As of last year, we changed that rule. We introduced a new version of Windows uh, that runs on an ARM-based chipset, and so that's an option now. And they are our thinnest, lightest, longest battery life uh, devices. We also introduced the eight-inch small screen, uh, and actually this runs from about uh, seven to 10 inch um, during the summer. The first device was the Acer W3. Um, this is a full PC. Like, the Windows, like Windows RT, it comes with Office 13 included. Um, and so are insanely good value devices. They now include Outlook. That's 260 euros worth of software that comes pre, uh, preloaded in these devices. But anyway, I just wanted to kind of categorize the various different types of a Windows-based tablet. Now, we didn't get everything right with Windows, with Windows 8. And I nearly had a coronary of my own when I saw this headline when I was standing in the cafeteria of Microsoft on the 7th of May this year. Microsoft repairs U-turn on Windows 8. Failure on par with the new Coke fiasco. The greatest climb down in corporate history, the greatest climb down in 35 years of corporate history. This is from an analyst in the UK. The Financial Times picked this up as a story and ran with it. Headline, not just on their UK edition, but on their global edition and the international edition. I don't know how many of you are old enough to remember a new Coke. I, I, I just about remember it. Coca-Cola changed their recipe, right? Consumers reacted really badly to it. Sales plummeted. They reversed. They put, new Coke, they put the old Coke back on the shelves. They called it Coke Classic. Think about that from a logistics point of view, from a supply chain point of view. Ingredients, packaging, marketing, Massive decision for Coke, massive decision. What did we do? We brought back the start button. We put the start button on the bottom left-hand side of the desktop again. That's the U-turn that they're talking about. 
And it's important to realize, and this then became the story, this Financial Times article then became the story. It was interesting to watch it evolve. Windows 8.1 came out on the 18th of October, and it absolutely is in sync with and builds upon the vision of Windows 8. We did, however, listen to considerable customer feedback, and we've made a number of different changes, but the strategy remains the same. It's still the start screen, it's still apps, it's still touch, uh, and so forth. I just thought that's an interesting, these are the kind of things that you have to deal with, because as I say, that then becomes the story and you're asked to comment on it. I won't go on about the success of Windows 8. We have had our challenges, there's no question. But I think this is interesting. As of August this year, after just 10 months of the platform, there were more Windows 8 machines in active use on a daily basis than all of the Macs on planet Earth. That's, over, that's well over 100 million users on a, on a daily basis. And so there are three ecosystems uh, that have clearly emerged iPad, very strong in the commercial space, very strong in the commercial space. We're seeing a lot of iPad in commercial. Also clearly got a very strong consumer story, always had, but has been massively overtaken by Android. The way we position our platform relative to the two others is, we can do everything that they can uh, in terms of the consumption of information, social media, web, movies, music, and so forth. And in many ways we do it better, and I could, that's another 40 minutes that we could talk about but it's also a tablet on which you can get work done. And that's how we position ourselves in the marketplace. You can get stuff done because it comes either preloaded with Office or it runs Office. It generally has a keyboard that comes with it or is an optional extra, but that was built to, made, built to go with that, with that tablet. And that's how we position ourselves relative to the others. Because there's no question, we are a challenger in this market. Nokia is interesting, of course, for two reasons. One, because of the big bet they made several years ago in terms of going fully Windows uh, in terms of their phone platform. It's also interesting because we are in the process of acquiring Nokia right now. And that's interesting. Microsoft is making a right angle turn right now in terms of strategy, a massive strategic shift to being a devices and services company. And the acquisition of Nokia is a big part of the execution of that strategy. When we started out, we covered a few of the different segments. We now cover them all. As Theo said, you know, we're coming, last year when I was standing up here, when, uh, when I had no network, we had less than 2% market share in Ireland. Today we have more than 10%. You need 10%. 10% is the kind of golden hurdle for the mobile industry. To be taken seriously and not be a bit player in the industry, you need 10% and we're growing. We've just overtaken iPhone in the Italian market. That's huge news. We're massively strong in, in, uh, in, in uh, Latin America. And we're growing all the time. So watch this space. Of course, this is just Nokia. There are devices from Sony, from Huawei, from Samsung, from HTC that are all Windows Phone as well. Nokia also interesting in that they are just launching their own tablet. Um, beautiful device, before G enabled, and a new series of phablets. This one shown here is 20 meg, uh, has a 20 meg camera. Completing the devices picture, you're probably wondering why is he showing Xbox One at a mobility, uh, at a mobility talk? But completing the devices picture is Xbox. Really important for us. Uh, number one gaming console in the world, really well established. It's, it's, a, it's at, at this stage a 12-year-old platform, Xbox is, uh, and Xbox One launches uh, in a couple of weeks' time, in a week's time. It'll be interesting to see how that goes. But this devices and services um, vision is about a consistent experience across phone, tablet, PC, laptop, desktop, and TV because of Xbox. So no matter what screen that you are consuming information through in your life, that you have this consistent user experience. You also have access to all of the same data, the same settings, the same documents, the same photos, the same music, the same videos, and so forth. And the enterprise space, oops, in the enterprise space, uh, same thing. This is more of delivering the mail rather than delivering the telegraph. Um, 
a consistent user experience across multiple different devices, access to my, all my data. Shall I do a quick demo? If the network cooperates, <laughs> I did, uh, I did say to Vodafone, uh, if they give me, and I know O2 is here uh, today, so I should have actually talked to O2, but uh, I said to Vodafone, if you give me a 4G dongle to use for the day, I'll mention it. So there you go, I've mentioned that it's plugged in. In fact, I'm gonna plug it into the side now, and we shall, uh, we shall give it a, a whirl. The point is that it's not about devices and services. It's about really engaging experiences on those devices and services. That's how we have to differentiate ourselves in, as a challenger in the marketplace. And so I just wanted to show you a couple of those, uh, a couple of those experiences that are now built into uh, to every Windows 8 tablet. Let me find my little list. Must have left my list down below. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> Okay, so any demo, I'll always start with, uh, with actually logging out of the device. So I'll just take maybe five minutes on this. Ooh, something I should have done there. I stopped the, uh, I stopped the uh, PowerPoint. Sorry, bear with me one second. Here we go, okay. So this is the first screen I'll see when I boot up a Windows device these days. You won't, but I will. This is a picture of a couple of my kids. And it's a theme that runs through any Windows 8.1 uh, demo is it's a very personalized experience. One of the things I can do now with Windows 8.1 is just get a quick show of hands. How many of you are using Windows 8 or Windows 8.1? Okay, so I don't know, is that half or, or something, like, something in that order? Of those, how many of you have downloaded Windows 8.1? So actually, maybe only half of those who are using Windows 8. So that's a free download. It's waiting for you in your Windows Store, and there are significant improvements uh, over 8, as I'll, I'll talk about. I'll talk about some of the challenges that we've had and some of the improvements we've made to address them as a challenger in the market. So one of the things is I can now flip up as before and get to my picture password, which we'll see in a moment. But another thing I can do is flip down. And now I can take a photograph. I don't know if I'm kind of shining up in the lights here. And it's a general point on, uh, on Windows uh, devices is that you can take a photograph, you can take a Skype call. Apps can access a locked device. So just as with Windows Phone, you can take a photograph of a locked device. Photographs don't tend to wait for, uh, hang on a sec, I unlock my device and I'll just capture that beautiful moment. Uh, same with Skype calls and so forth. So I can take a photograph and that's new. This is a picture password as before. It's a picture of my third son, Charlie. I have three finger strokes that I associate with photograph and that's how I log into the device. Compare that with control, alt, delete. We kind of never really thought about it but control, alt, delete was around for so long it just became a normal part of our lives. But control, alt, delete as a user experience, now we're logging in using things like picture password. And I get into my, my, uh, my start screen and many of you will be familiar with this. This is where I access all my tiles and my, all my apps from. Each app is represented by what we call a live tile. And so there's information that's relevant to me are coming through from the cloud. My new apps, new followers on Twitter, whatever it is, Facebook updates and so forth. Now, because this is about mobility, let's talk about the cloud for a moment. This is where I access all of my, uh, my data in the cloud. Every Windows device comes with seven gigs of free storage in the cloud, we call that SkyDrive. We've actually just lost a battle, well during the summer lost a battle with Sky, B Sky B took us to court, won, and we've lost the name SkyDrive. And so in the new year, we'll be changing the name of SkyDrive, our cloud service. But anyway, I digress. Um, I'm not connected to the internet, eh? Let's just address that. Okay, so hopefully that'll connect now. So this is my SkyDrive account, but what we've done is built SkyDrive fundamentally into the OS. So here's the desktop that those of you who use Windows 7 will be familiar with, or, X, or uh, XP or Vista. What we've done here is, if I open up uh, Windows Explorer, I get access to my SkyDrive as well. So there's those same, whatever it is, 20 folders. This is my SkyDrive account. 
Um, and so any changes I make in there, I will, uh, will automatically update and sync through the cloud. A change we made actually in 8.1 is that these files are available off, uh, online only. And so we used to sync your, your SkyDrive up with every device. We now just sync the metadata associate, associated with that uh, file uh, to the device, and you can get access to it if you are online. It's to stop chewing up the disk on, on lots, of your different, uh, lots of your different devices. Here's the start button I mentioned. It's back on the lower left-hand side. Instead of a vertical menu of all my apps and services, I now get a horizontal menu of all my apps and services. And it's the start screen. And so that's one way of looking at the start screen is it is the replacement of the start menu. All the information is arranged the way I want it. I've moved them all into groups. I've changed the different uh, sizes of tile and all the rest of it. Now, tone of engaging experiences. Bing is our search engine in Microsoft. We've invested very heavily in Bing in the US, in the UK, in Germany, and France. And that investment is about to come to Ireland, I'm told, by the end of the year. When that happens, Bing will be a phenomenal search engine, as it is in those markets today. But something that is available in the Irish market today from Bing is a broad range of different uh, apps. Bing basically aggregates information from around the internet around certain themes. So one of those themes is travel. If I just show you uh, the travel app, so I can go in here, do a search for whatever it is. Uh, Dublin. And they've aggregated lots of information about Dublin. We have this for pretty much every, uh, every city around the world. Maps, currencies, flights, photographs, traveler photographs, panoramic views, uh, feeds from Michelin, Foders, Frommers, TripAdvisor, uh, Lonely Planet, and so forth. So I can say, show me the best attractions according to Foders, the best hotels according to uh, TripAdvisor, and so forth. One of the things I really like about this is we have nine panoramic views for every city in the world uh, built in. And so I can move around uh, those panoramic views and kind of check out the location. Someone said this was the cheapest way of traveling uh, because I, can, I feel like I've actually been there. But actually now something we've done is, I'm kind of wired in here, but hopefully you can see that as I move the, ta the uh, tablet around, it's using the accelerometer and the compass that's built into the tablet to actually look around that, that view. I used to demonstrate that in Windows 8, and people say, wow, that's pretty cool. Is that something you can do yourself? And I say, no, no, that's kind of pre-built in. Um, they're they're pre-built in images. But that's now changed with Windows 8.1. So this is, the, uh, this is the camera app. It's going to be very difficult to do. But hopefully you can see, without pressing any buttons, this is called Photosynth technology. And as soon as it feels it has another image that can complete the picture, I am now pulling together a 360 degree panoramic view of this scene that's in front of me. And then I hit OK and I go to Stitch and all the rest of it. Phenomenal. In true Blue Peter style, here's one I made earlier. Before you guys all came in and the people who were sitting there were going, what's that guy doing? And I think this is it here. And so I can do exactly the same. Kind of weird, I shine it in front of you and you all, you've all disappeared. So this is an image I took earlier on. It's 360 degree panoramic view of the Helix Theater with the sound check guy's head chopped off. <laughs> now, one of the things, and I'm, I'm, I'm gonna wrap up now fairly shortly, but one of the things that we really did not get right with Windows 8 was we underestimated the scale of change between XP Vista 7 and Windows 8. And that was a big piece of feedback that we've had. And one of the ways, we've addressed that in a number of different ways, but one of the ways that we've uh, addressed that is this app called Help and Tips. This is Windows 8.1 in 20 minutes. I go into each module, the modules aren't particularly long, I've got uh, video and all the rest of it, and I can go to touch, or I can go to mouse and keyboard if I have a non-touch device. And so I get guidance on exactly how to use every aspect of the Windows 8 experience. A common scenario is when I go home in the evening, I hand over the tablet to the kids, right? Because this is uh, the Windows platform, it support, supports multiple profiles. So this is my son, Charlie, in the top left-hand side there. This is his picture password, and now I'm logged in as Charlie. Charlie has no access now to my work stuff. He can't inadvertently delete uh, um, apps. He can't send emails on my behalf, but he can play games to his heart's content. Or rather, he could do, 
but I'm also using a feature that's built into every Windows 8.1 device called Family Safety that allows me to set the maximum hours of uh, the day that Charlie has access to this profile, the time of day, the day of week. Uh, I can age restrict uh, websites, apps. Uh, I can blacklist websites like Facebook because he's only seven. And I get a report on a weekly basis that says, here's every website he visited, here's every app he used. And toggling between the two, uh, the two different uh, profiles is, is very straightforward. Now, last feature I want to show you, because there are a lot of people in the audience uh, who are uh, Windows 8 users or Windows 8.1. Of you, how many of you are aware of the music app? A very, very small handful. This is 30 million songs. This is as big as iTunes. This is bigger than Spotify. Uh, and it's completely free. And it's built into every single Windows 8 and Windows 8.1 device. Um, something that's quite cool with this is, if I go into uh, Internet Explorer here and go to something like Electric Picnic, and I see the lineup of Electric Picnic, I can share that using the share functionality. So as normal, I can share that through an email, I can put it into my reading list, I can put it onto OneNote and so forth. But I can also do this, create a playlist. It's now looking down through that HTML file that that web page is, and it's pulling out every artist's name. It's going into Xbox Music, it's searching for them, and it's pulling together a playlist. It'll take a minute. Just while it's doing that, the biggest strength of Xbox Music is the breadth of its catalog. And so I have about a 98% hit ratio with this test, but I'm gonna ask someone in the audience to call out an obscure band. And by the way, there's the playlist. So I hit click playlist, and it's now putting that into Xbox Music, and we'll see that in a moment. Someone call out an obscure band from any era, any genre. Say again. Violent Roadkill, okay. <laughs> Is that a movie or a band? <laughs> okay, so let's go into Xbox Music. So there, by the way, you see, you see up in my playlist now, Line Up Electric Picnic. I can now play that. That's the full list of who's in Electric Picnic, and I've got a playlist. All of you who are using Windows 8 have this, and it's completely free. Now, Violent Roadkill, eh? We've got Violence, Violence Affair, <laughs> Roadkill. I don't think we have Violent Roadkill. So I've been caught out. Now to anyone who catches me out, because it is genuinely very rare. I, I, I honestly did probably 100 demos at, at uh, the, the Web Summit last week, and one person caught me out. So for anyone who catches me out, I always give them a copy. This is Windows 8 Pro. It's now Windows 8.1 Pro, because when you go and install this, this will be waiting for you in your Windows Store. So well done. Not at all. <laughs> Final roadkill, eh? Uh, so look, I'm going to leave it there. Uh, hopefully you've seen, uh, you know, the world is changing very rapidly, as we saw uh, happen with the Telegraph and, and, the, uh, and the Pony Express. With technology, you need to stay in the game. You need to run very fast to stay in the game. We are very much in the game. We're a third uh, player now in terms of tablets and in phones, but we're catching up uh, pretty dramatically well. Um, hopefully you'll agree it's through experiences like that that you've seen today, and I've just given you a, a very uh, short demo of, of some of these things, that it's these kinds of things, these experiences that will actually differentiate ourselves, um, as well as you know, the beautiful devices and the, and the hardware and the USB connectivity and all the rest of it that goes with it. Um, but it's more about the, uh, the engaging user experiences, and hopefully we've given you a, a bit of a taste of that. So I'll leave it there. Thank you very much.